Hi, and welcome to uh, the Oklahoman and News of OK. I'm Paul Moniz, energy reporter here at the Oklahoman. Uh, I'm joined here today with Mario Hurtado. Um, he's the executive vice president of Clean Line Energy Partners, and uh, he's also in charge of the Plains and Eastern project. It's uh, about a 700 mile uh, long uh, high voltage uh, direct current transmission line that's going to stretch from the Oklahoma Panhandle to um, kind of western Tennessee and take electricity straight from wind farms to kind of utilities in the southeast. Uh, it's been a long time project um, that's still kind of in its development phase, but it's getting closer and closer. And uh, Mario is joining us today with uh, an update on the project. Hi, Mario. Great. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, we're very excited. We, we, we're we drawing towards the end of our um, main permitting process. So, uh, you know, what I came to talk about today is really that we hope that um, in October and then by the end of the year, we'll have two major steps in our approval process. In October, we're we understand that the final environmental impact statement for our process, for our project, will be issued, um, and that will indicate, you know, what the environmentally preferred route is for the project. Um, several routes have been under consideration. Clean Line has proposed a route, and there's been a lot of years of study done on the different alternatives, and so we're excited for that to come to a conclusion. Uh, and then we're expecting a final decision uh, from the Department of Energy on our project um, by the end of the year, and that will really conclude the formal permitting for the project. Okay. Um, so, you know, from that point on, we'll be focused on completing our large commercial contracts um, because this project will be paid for by the people who use the transmission line. So we'll have long-term contracts from shippers um, that will largely be wind generators in the Oklahoma Panhandle region that want to access that market in the southeast that you talked about um, and in the mid-south. Okay. Um, can you give me a quick rundown of kind of all the stuff that this environmental uh, impact statement uh, process has looked at? I mean everything from wildlife to um, impacts on neighboring properties, nearby homeowners. Give me a quick rundown of kind of what, what, what's involved in that process. Sure, that, it, it's a very uh, comprehensive process for, uh, when, when the federal government or an agency decides to do an environmental impact statement, and that's the case in this project. So that means that they look at all of the potential impacts on the environment, and that includes not just the natural environment that we naturally think about, like streams and waters and rivers and wildlife, but also the human environment. So there's an analysis of possible socioeconomic impacts and other impacts. And um, what, the, what the process has done is looked at a proposed route that Clean Line has come up with and looked at alternative routes and alternative locations for the project uh, and compared all of that and put all of that analysis in front of the public. Okay. Um, so they did that in draft form uh, at the end of 2014. Uh, the, that draft was available for public comment for about 120 days. And now the Department of Energy and their experts are going over the comments that were made on the project, on that draft. Um, they're uh, making sure that they address all of those comments in the final environmental impact statement um, and then come up with a final answer on what's the best place for this project to go. Okay. Um, and I know that the, your team has worked uh, for quite a while with landowners in various areas throughout the, the corridor, the proposed corridor for project. I mean, what are some of the frequent concerns you get from landowners? Sure. Well, landowners are always, you know, they're always, um, they want to know where will the project go, um, what would it look like, how big will it be, and how will it impact my daily life and my land. Um, and so one of the um, advantages of going out early in a process like this is that you have a chance to talk about those things early on in the process. Um, the disadvantage can be that there's always some uncertainty about what that final location will be. And that's why we're excited about coming, this process coming to a close and having a final environmental impact statement because we'll be able to define this as the route. Um, so once we have that location, we've been able to talk to landowners about what the project will look like. Um, it'll have a 150 to 200 foot right of way. Uh, we've been able to talk to them about how they'll be able to continue their normal activities, be it agriculture, growing full-size crops, or grazing, or other uses, because most of that easement that's used for the transmission line um, you know, will be empty because the transmission line will be in the air. Right. And so they'll be able to continue to use that land. And then finally, um, landowners are very, you know, want to know, well, what will I get for this and what's my compensation? And so we've come up with a market leading compensation package uh, where we'll pay landowners 100% of the full market value of that easement, the square footage where the line will go. Okay. Plus, we'll pay them if they have a structure on their land. And we've made it so that the landowner can choose to receive a one time payment if they have a structure on their land or annual payments that will last for as long as the transmission line is on their property. Okay. And then, um, obviously, the, a lot of the route has come through Oklahoma. There's a lot of tribal um, history here in the state. Um, 
what kind of cultural studies have has gone on during this project as well? Well, um, there's a very important component uh, to the process which has to do with the respect for cultural resources. Um, and so the Department of Energy has led that process as well. Uh, they've reached out to the different uh, Indian tribes as well as the State Historic Preservation Offices and other parties that are interested in cultural preservation and history. Uh, they've gotten lots of comments about the route. Um, and they've also been negotiating an agreement which will set out how the project will take care of any artifacts that come up, uh, how they'll be preserved, and how they'll be taken care of in a responsible way. Okay. So that will also be um, available as part of the final environmental impact statement. Okay. And you know, as folks walk, watch for this final environment, environmental impact statement later this year, um, presuming everything goes well and the federal government decides to get involved, uh, what's the kind of timeline coming out? I mean, when can we expect construction to start? Well, we think it'll probably take us a year plus to be able to get to construction from the time that we get this final approval that's now slated to be towards the end of the year. Um, you know, there's commercial contracts to finalize, different other elements to do. Um, we're going to begin to do some of the right-of-way acquisition that, that you and I have just been talking about, and that process will take about a year. Um, and so, you know, we're nearing the end of the development phase, entering more of the pre-construction phase, and then the full construction phase will start when we mobilize for construction, which we expect to happen at the very, early, very earliest at the end of 2016, more likely in 2017. Okay. And then it'll take about two to three years to build the project. So we hope to be in commercial operation um, by the end of 2019 or in 2020. Okay. And tell me just about how the, the project is structured economically. It's all private funding, all private investment. Um, how much have you spent? kind of in this uh, NEPA process for environmental studies? Sure, this NEPA process you know, is a multi-year process, as I mentioned. It's been over three years and about 15 to $20 million just on the environmental review. It takes many tens of millions of dollars to put a project like this together. Um, it is a you know, over $2 billion investment uh, just in the transmission part of the project, which is what Clean Line does. Um, but it also is going to make possible 5 to $7 billion of new investment, uh, largely in wind generation in the Oklahoma Panhandle region that these generation companies will undertake. And so um, while it's a large investment up front, it's also a very big investment uh, in the long-term infrastructure of the state. Great. Well, uh, appreciate you joining us today and giving us an update on the project. Uh, once again, I'm Paul Moneys with The Oklahoman, and this was Mario Vitardo uh, with uh, Clean Line Energy Partners. Thank you. Thanks.